All right. YT, how y'all doing tonight? Doing good, doing great, doing awesome, fantastic. Hey, who was here last week? Why don't we give Chase another round of applause? Y'all get up, yep, 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 yep. Everybody celebrate Chase. Chase, Chase, Chase. If you missed it, Chase gave his first message ever. He spoke on why meekness wasn't weakness. It is on our YouTube. If you didn't know we have a YouTube, we have a YouTube. If you didn't know we have an Instagram, we have one of those too. And you can get to the YouTube from the Instagram. So two for one. But go watch it if you haven't watched it. It's amazing. He spit some hot fire. It was really good. I wanted to brag on him again. And uh, I know plenty of grown men and women that would not step up here and do what he did. So to be a teenager, to be in high school and step up in front of his peers and be able to deliver that message, power to you. I'm proud of you, man. That's amazing. It's amazing. And, and this is the thing, right? Don't think he wasn't afraid. I know he was. But he also knew what said to us in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, which is God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love. I think I got that out of order. No, power, love, and a sound mind. That's right. Power, love, and a sound mind. And he rested on that blessed assurance and came up here and gave an amazing message. Congratulations, man. I'm glad you finally did it. Took him a year. Just think about that. Something you are deathly afraid of today, a year from now, you could be doing. A year from now, you could be doing if you put your mind to it, you stay intentional, you put the pedal to the grindstone, one year from now, the things you could accomplish are things you swore today would never be possible. That's encouraged. That's a message. Preach that. Preach that right there. Yeah. Clap, clap. Thank you, Rowan. He gets it. Good job, Rowan. Yeah, Rowan, you got a fan club of some high school girls, man. Good for you. Yeah. Lori and Eric, look out. All right. So while I was sitting here listening to Chase's awesome message, uh, he, he brought up Revelation 4, 8. And what really drew me in was I was like, man, I've heard that before. I've heard that before, but not in Revelation. I'd heard that somewhere else, somewhere else in the Bible. And it's crazy when you really dig into it. It's that the Bible isn't just this like linear story from page one to page last, but there's forward and back and there's parallels and there's references all throughout the Bible that all tie into each other. They all tie into each other. There's tens of thousands of cross references within the Bible. There's actually someone that made a really cool graphic I found online. Can we dim the lights a little bit? So every arc here, here is a cross-reference in the Bible. This being Genesis, this being Revelation, all of these are cross-references that occur in the Bible between books and between stories that relate to each other or reference each other. And I thought that was amazing to look at. I believe there's 43,000 cross-references right here in this picture. And it looks like a rainbow, which is also super cool, because does anybody know what a rainbow represents? It's God's promise, right? God doesn't break his promises. We can get the house lights back up, please. So I wanted to show that to you because the Bible, we think of it as this like single big book, but it's not. I want to talk before I get into my message just about the Bible a little bit, right? Because the Bible, a lot of us know it's the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Old Testament is before Jesus. New Testament is Jesus and forward. But within those is 66 books, and those 66 books have a lot of different authors, many different authors, people that never met, people that never spoke, but yet these cross-references and these fulfillments of scripture happen back and forth in the Bible time and time again. And what it really points to is that the Bible is God-breathed and divine, that it is God's inherent word and nothing else could sew together this many coincidences into one work of literature. You couldn't do it if you tried. It's absolutely astounding when you start looking through it. But as we look into the Bible a little bit, right, you got the Old Testament, the New Testament, 66 books. You have some that speak of the past, like Genesis is written about the past. You have some that speak about the present day as they're written, the Gospels, the walks with Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're written present. And you have things that speak of the future, like Revelation. Those are called prophecy. They speak of things that haven't come yet. Well, the Old Testament is actually full of prophecy, a ton of prophecy. Why, you might ask, why are there so many prophecy in the old book? Well, it's because so much of the Old Testament was pointing to the fact that Jesus was coming. So much of the Old Testament, which is Jewish scripture, if you didn't know, was pointing to the fact that there was a savior whose name was Jesus Christ that was coming 
so that you could be forgiven for your sins. So all of that prophecy is really just like the layup alley-oop for Jesus to slam dunk home when he got up to the hoop. If you don't know what basketball is, an alley-oop, it's like when one guy and then the other, and it's, yeah, like that, like battle. He's, yep, high battle. Okay, so anyway, starting from the beginning of the Bible, you got the first five books. Those are known, anybody know the big P word that those are known as? Pentateuch. I heard someone say it, I think. So the Pentateuch, the first five books, those are the Moses books, right? First five books. And then after that, from Joshua to Esther, you have the historical books. And then you go from Job to Songs, and that's the poetic books. And then we arrive to these things called the prophetic books. And these are books of prophecy, prophetic books. The first book in the prophetic books is called Isaiah. And Isaiah, as you could probably guess, was a prophet, he was the first major prophet. He's known as the Prince of Prophets, the first major prophet. And I looked up what his name meant, and sure enough, it means the Lord helps me. And I thought that was really cool, that the first prophet's name literally translates to the Lord helps me. But he was a prophet for numerous kings in the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, I'm giving you a lot of history right now. I'm kind of setting this up for you. The tribe of Judah is one of 12 tribes of Israel, all of them named after a different son of Jacob. So he had Jacob, he had 12 sons, Judah being one of them, tribe of Judah leads all the way to King David. Spoiler alert, King David leads to Jesus. So the tribe of Judah is the lineage of Jesus. Y'all tracking? Awesome. Amazing. So this happens, the book of Isaiah is about 700 years before Jesus, just to give you a timestamp, like 700 years BC. So what exactly is a prophet? Let me hear one, some of y'all's definitions. What do you think a prophet is? Yeah. Someone that tells the future. Is that what you were going to say? Cool. Anybody else? Someone important who might change the future. One more. Yeah. One of God's... Thank you, L. One of God's messengers. That was... I got you. Yeah. One of God's messengers. So unlike kings... Unlike princes who are born in lineage, who are born into royalty, prophets do not have anything to do with birthright. It doesn't matter who your daddy is. doesn't matter who your mama is. God can pick anybody to be somebody who is a mouthpiece for God. Anybody can be chosen as a prophet. And just because you want to be a prophet or you want somebody else to be a prophet, it don't mean nothing. That's not how it works. It's not because your daddy was a prophet, you're going to be a prophet. It doesn't work that way. It's not like being a king or a prince. It's somebody who is chosen to proclaim a message from God to people. That is a prophet. Cool? So on several occasions, God picks prophets to tell a message, maybe two messages. And then on other occasions, he'll pick a prophet to be used for almost their entire lifetime to just be a mouthpiece of God for their entire lifetime. Isaiah falls under the latter category. Under numerous kings, he was a mouthpiece for God. And it has nothing to do with man and everything to do with the relationship with God. That is what a prophet is. So I said a little history, I said a little background, I taught you a little bit about the Bible, and now I wanna dive into scripture. We're gonna be going to the book of Isaiah, starting in chapter six on verse one. If you have a Bible or the Bible app, feel free to read along. If not, it's behind me. It says, it was in the year King Isaiah died that I saw the Lord. I being Isaiah, it's the first person. He's talking about himself. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. So imagine this, right? You're a prophet. You're chosen by God to speak for God. The first five chapters of Isaiah, you don't need to know the first five chapters to understand the message today, but what it was was vision and prophecy that God had given Isaiah for him to speak. And what it was all about was about how Judah, the tribe of Judah, had fallen out of favor with God, about how they were doing no-nos. They were doing the wrong things. They were doing things that were not glorifying God, and they were turning away from God. And if you track through the whole Old Testament, God's chosen people constantly fall out of grace with God because they choose worldly things and to fall away and to take idols. And then at the bottom, they're like, oh, God, where are you? And then they find God again, and then everything's good. And they're like, nah, forget about that guy. I'm going to do my own thing. And then they're like, God, where are you? And, they, and it was... This ebb and flow that God's people constantly do. So they're on the downswing of one of these periods right now. And he's coming to Isaiah, and Isaiah is giving prophecy about how poorly the tribe of Judah is doing. That's the first five chapters of Isaiah. Cool? Cool. So God wasn't stoked with them. And, you know, I, I find myself 
going through that too, and I feel like a lot of us do, where it's easy to pray and call out for God when everything's bad, but you forget to thank him when everything's good, and then you wonder why everything gets bad again, and then you start praying, and then God shows up, and you get to the top of the mountain, and then you forget some more, and then you fall, and you're like, man, how'd I end up here again? I learned my lesson, but you didn't, and then you forget again. So it's easy to look at history and be like, Israel, you're so dumb. But then like Steve, well, you're pretty dumb too. Cause I also forget my blessings sometime at the top of the mountain, the same way I cry out for them at the bottom of the valley. All right. So all of a sudden God appears to Isaiah on his throne and it's so massive and so immense. And his robe is absolutely filling the temple. Let's pick up verse two. It says, attending him were mighty seraphim each having six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And if you were here last week, those are almost the exact words that the seraphim were saying in the throne room in Revelation when Chase preached his message. This is one of those parallels that brings you back and forth and shows the continuity of God because God never changes. God is constant. We change. But God is always the same. Also, aside, biblical angels are terrifying. If you read through the Bible, every time an angel appears, it says like, oh, he hid in fear. Oh, he cowered. And you're like, why? And then you read how they're covered in eyes and have six wings and they're giant balls of fire. Biblical angels are scary. It is not the angels that Hollywood has made out. Get into your Bible and go read about some angels. So right now we have a sick winged creature covering its eyes and its feet with four of those wings and other wings stretched out, circling a throne with God sitting in the middle. Are you afraid yet? Me too. Me too. <laughs> All right, so we pick up in verse four. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with their smoke. Six seraphim, these are high ranking angelic creatures, are so humbled that all they can do is stand around and declare the glory of God. Glory, glory, glory to the God Almighty. It's exactly what Chase preached about last week. And we see it again, but not in Revelation at the end of the Bible. This is Isaiah about midway through the Old Testament way back, 700 years before Jesus. And the same thing is being said. And it's being said so loudly and so profoundly that it is shaking the entire temple. What would be going through your head at this point? If you were sitting there, the walls were literally shaking as these six winged angels circled the most powerful being to ever exist in creation. And you're this big. How would you feel? to be in such greatness. I mean, what it would make me feel is exactly how small I am. It would make me realize that with a God that big, I am so small. It would be an instant feeling of humility, of humbleness, to be in the presence of something so great. But this is where humility and humbleness get scary. It is a slippery slope where humility and humbleness can quickly turn into inadequacy. To a feeling that you're not enough, that you're never enough, that you can't be enough, and that you can't measure up because you're undeserving. And those aren't the same things. So let's see whether Isaiah, the first major prophet of the Old Testament, bows his knee in humbleness and humility, or falls into a pit of inadequacy. Verse five, it says, then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. And right there in that moment, we see it unfold in real time. A man chosen to be the mouthpiece of God, a man who has already given vision and prophecy directly from God to his people, understands how small he is and feels worthless. Not humble, but inadequate. It's crazy, right? God's presence, the Holy Spirit, should fill you with, and if you ever served in big city or wild country, you could say it with me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit, not a coconut. <laughs> Serving kids, you'll get that joke later. Um, but the, the fruits of the Spirit don't include worthlessness, inadequacy. So where does that 
come from? Why do those come into play? Well, let's dive a little deeper. And I want to tell you about Pastor Steve's life a little bit, about my past. Some of you may know some of it. Some of you have maybe never heard this part of my story. So when I got saved, it was at a night of worship at Momentum Church in 2017. It was the best night of my life. What I honestly felt was like every burden, every weight, every shackle had fallen and I was free and I was light and I was on the top of the mountain because I had a savior and his name was Jesus Christ. And I was here, I was all the way up here until the next day. Why? Because the next day God showed up and I was sitting in the throne room and I was looking at how great he was and how undeserving and small I felt. And a lot of that comes from the fact that I didn't really understand what Jesus's loving relationship meant for me. I knew who he was. I knew he was Lord. I knew I was a new person in him, but I was sitting on blessed assurance while holding all the weight of the sins and the shame of my past. And the two could not coexist. How could I ever deserve this? How could something that good ever love me? It was the hardest day the day after my salvation. But since then, and I've said this to a thousand people, I've come to the realization that nothing about following Jesus makes your life easy. It makes it worth it. And things that are worthwhile are often the hardest things you'll ever have to do. Nobody wins an Olympic medal by sitting home on a couch. Sweat equity, blood, tears, effort, hard, hard things. The day after my salvation was the most mortal and inadequate I'd ever felt in my entire life. I was living in ignorant bliss before that. I thought I was a good enough person. I didn't understand the weight of my actions or the consequences or or the sins that I was carrying out every day because I didn't know any better. So how could I understand the weight if I didn't know? It was pure, ignorant bliss. And the world didn't help because the world around you has a funny way of normalizing immorality if not celebrating it. So you gotta be careful about looking to the world to validate yourself. I thought I was good enough. I was living an okay life. I gave money to some homeless people. I held doors for ladies. I pulled out some chairs. Like I must be great. Let alone the fact that I was going out drinking with my buddies. I was chasing everything with two legs and uh, you know, I didn't really honor my mother and my father. I had the mouth of a sailor cause I am a sailor, but I didn't need to celebrate it. But no, I was good enough. Cause I did a couple little things right. Right? Wrong. I just didn't know any better. What I was really doing was trying to live my life so that anybody from the outside looking in thought I was good. Well, on the inside, I was empty and broken and rotten. And I didn't know any better. I thought the guilt of all of it was going to drown me. I didn't understand what his love meant. I didn't understand how he could love me. And I looked at this story and I realized that Isaiah is in a very similar boat. So I want to jump into verse six and see what happens next. It says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. I am here to tell you that Jesus Christ is the coal that touches your lips He is the one who can abolish your guilt and forgive your sins. In Christ alone, do we have a way to the Father? He's not a way. He's the way to the Father, the only way, the way, the truth, the life. And I'm here to tell you that if you think you alone are enough, then you are living on borrowed time. You will never be able to earn or achieve a way to the love and the peace that Jesus has for you. But I also know that at times... With a God so great, you think, I probably don't deserve that love. I probably don't deserve that forgiveness. And if he knew me, if he knew the real me, he wouldn't want me anyway. I'm here to tell you that at 33 years old, I still remember what it's like to be a teenager in high school. I know it was like eight ice ages ago, but I still know the pressure you carry daily. I still understand what it's like, the pressure to be prettier, skinnier, less skinny, speak more, speak less, dress better, stay in your place. Women learn your place. Men be strong. Women be skinny. Men be muscular. I still understand the perceived pressure that is put on you each and every day. 
I also know what it's like to look in the mirror and not love the reflection that you see. Not only not love it, but absolutely detest it. To feel inadequate in every single way possible and to feel like you're never gonna reach anybody's standards put in front of you. That no one could ever like you because you don't like you. I know how it feels to hold on to guilt over the things you've done, over words you've said or actions you've done that you cannot take back. I also know that the world can be cruel. That some of you hear more negatives than positives and oftentimes it's from the people that are supposed to love you most. I know that some of you carry hidden shame and questions that you might never get answers for, like why did that parent leave? Why did my sibling or my family have to pass away? If God is so good and loving, then why do bad things happen to me? I know what it feels like to be inadequate. I know what it feels like to be broken, incomplete, not enough, like a failure. And I know those feelings exist, but I'm here to tell you, just like I did in week one, that feelings are not your facts and the facts do not care about your feelings. Feelings will lie to you. They will whisper into your ear every day, but God's truth will stand forever. So just like I did in week one, I brought it back to scripture to give you another list of the things that God says about you. You are beloved, you are a masterpiece, you are chosen, you are holy, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are an image bearer of God, you're a child of the king, and you are worth more than gold. He numbered the hairs on your head. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. He loved you so much that when he put your fingerprints on you, he swore to never make another one like you. God made you in his image. You are not a mistake. Your gender is not a mistake. Your height's not a mistake. Your appearance is not a mistake. Where you live, who your family is, the fact that you're alive is not a mistake. You are not a mistake because God doesn't make mistakes and God made you. So what happened to Isaiah next? Where does his story end? Well, after an angel told him that God forgave all his sins and abolished all his shame, God asked something else of Isaiah. And it's in fact, it's something that God has continued to ask all Christ followers to this day. It's something that all of you who have raised your hand and given your life to Christ, it's something that's been asked of you directly by Jesus. Verse eight says, whom should I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? And Isaiah's response was, here I am send me. Send me. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Tomorrow is not promised for anyone. And I know that's hard to hear, but believe me, if you think hell is a very real place, like I do, and the actions that you take on this earth affect whether people go there or not, then where is your sense of urgency? What is holding you back? If the things holding you back are the anchors of the enemy that I've spoken about and we've spoken about throughout this whole series, inadequacy, shame, guilt, fear, weakness, timidity, any of it, we're not going to leave here today until you lay all of it at the altar. Until all those chains have fallen and all that weight is dropped. I'm going to open the altar here in a second for you to come down and submit it at the foot of the cross. Let Jesus be the cold to your lips that releases you from any guilt and any sin that you carried in here. So Tyler's going to come back up here. He's going to grab his guitar and he's going to play as long as he needs to. If you have any weight, I want you to come up, kneel at the, at the altar. I want you to pray. I want you to release it. I want you to give it up to God. And if you feel like you do not have anything to release, I want you to come pray with somebody. I want you to come lay hands on. I want you to be their support. I want you to be a family. And this is why. We're in a warehouse. But the church ain't about a building. Y'all are the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And right now, right here, is where we make the enemy tremble. Because right here at the altar, we are going to scream from the depths of our soul that the enemy has no power here. And the gates of hell will not prevail. So right now, as the music plays, I want you to come forward. I want you to come to the altar. I want to pray with you. I know students want to pray with you. I know leaders want to pray with you. And leaders, if you have something to release too, come take a knee right next to them. And we will sit here in this moment as long as we need to.
God, as we continue to pray up here at the altar, I don't want to rush this moment. I don't want to force this moment. But God, I just want to ask that you descend here and allow these chains to fall, for these weights to be released, whether it's fear, whether it's timidity, whether it's a feeling of inadequacy, it's depression, it's anxiety. God, I ask that these people can release it at the foot of the cross right now, God that they can look around and they can see the family that is surrounding them. They can see the body of Christ as it surrounds them and it hugs them and it loves them because Jesus, that is what you are. You are love above all else, God. God, I ask for peace as people walk out of here, that the chains and the anchors that the enemy has tried to hold them back are released and the blessed assurance that you, God, can release all the shame can forgive every sin is the truth that echoes in their head as they walk through that door. God, the truth is you forgave us for everything we did in the past, everything we're currently doing and everything in the future. That's the good news. The bad news, God, and what we know is that now it's time to change in response to that salvation. That God, we wanna live like you. We want to walk like you. We want to embody the values that you've given us, Jesus. And for some of us, that is a big life change. That is releasing the things of our past. That is letting go to the things that we used to love, letting go of the things that we used to do and moving forward in the spirit of Jesus Christ as new and changed people, not just by title, not just by name, but by action. Because God, if the world cannot tell we are a Christian by the way that we act, then what are we doing? God, we love you for everything that you've given us, every blessing that you've given us. We're thankful that there is a youth group full of leaders who truly love our high schoolers here in Gulf Breeze, Pensacola, and Navarre. God, I am thankful that you have put those leaders in my way because without them, I'm just a man with a microphone. And I am so thankful for every leader that you bless me with, for every student who has given their life to Christ in this room, for the 28 who have already raised their hands this year at YTH Jesus, whose lives are radically changed forever because they're filled with the Holy Spirit and the promise that you have given them, God. God, thank you. Thank you for everything. And allow us to continue to praise, not only in the good times, not only in the bad times, but all the time. When we're in the mountain or the valley, it is the same God. And allow us to raise our praises so that we don't follow the ebb and the flow of the tribe of Judah where we pray for you when we're in the valley, but when we reach the mountaintop, we forget what got us there. Let us always continue to remember who you are and what you've done for us, God. Jesus, thank you for this family that you have woven together, for the blood that you shed on the cross for us. May we never take for granted the sacrifice that you made. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You down front continue to pray. Stay as long as you need to. I never want to leave one of these gatherings without offering the opportunity for you to move into a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, God, what he wanted for you was an eternal life with him. But by our choice, we let sin enter the world and it caused an eternal separation from God. But because he is a loving God, he made a way in Jesus Christ for himself to be 100% God and 100% man and come down and sacrifice himself on the cross for our sins, for our transgressions. He took all the wrath of God, every bit of it, so that you wouldn't have to. And because of that, you get grace, you get salvation, and you get love. That although we are broken, we are imperfect, we still get an eternity with our Savior. So right now, we're all going to pray together. It's called a sinner's prayer. And you're not praying to me or through me. We're praying together. God is here. He's on teleconference. He's listening in. And he's waiting to see if anybody here wants to begin a relationship with Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean you have all the answers. It doesn't mean you don't have doubt. What it means is that you believe Jesus Christ is Lord. In your heart, you confess it with your mouth and you're ready to live for him. So everybody close your eyes and bow your head. If you're up front, continue to pray. I don't want to stifle it. And y'all repeat after me. Say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do 
to save myself. I know without you, there's no way for me to get to heaven. I believe that you died for my sins and my salvation. I believe that you rose again and ascended to heaven. As best as I can, I transfer my trust to you. I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I give you my life, I receive your life. Now teach me how to live. With heads bowed and eyes closed, in a second I'm gonna count to three, and if you prayed that for the first time and you truly wish to begin a relationship with Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to put your hands straight up in the air, as high and as proud as you can. It's not for anybody else but you and God. The only reason my eyes are open is so I can connect with you afterwards and resource you about the best choice you could ever make in your entire life. So nobody is looking around, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Don't hesitate, don't be afraid. When I say three, put that hand up. One, God's leaning in. Two, three. All right, put those hands down, everybody eyes open. Let's give a round of applause to the people that just gave their life to Christ. 